Yeah, no, it's not a cord on it. Is that clear enough? I've never actually asked. Is it clear enough with um, the lighting and everything? Yeah. Okay. Well, let's get started. Um, today, uh, we've got a new study guide. So, um, if you don't have a study guide, anybody need a study guide? New, new study guide. Okay, it's entitled "How Near Is the End?" And uh, now, last week I did say that this week we'd have the second part to our presentation about the uh, forbidden prophecy, the seventy weeks of Daniel, chapter nine. Well, I sort of thought about it, and um, I decided to save that message until a later time because I think that last week the um, the point that we were able to make, the lesson that we were able to draw from our study was um, clear enough. Okay, we made a, a, a powerful and solid conclusion about just, just how important the study of prophecy is. And uh, if, you, if you didn't see it, we do have it on video and uh, we will release that. Okay. So this week, uh, and of course uh, the 70 weeks of Daniel chapter 9, I also said that we will be revisiting that prophecy uh, multiple times over the course of this seminar, so there will be plenty of opportunity to, uh, to study that remarkable prophecy even further. Okay. So again, uh, today we have a brand new message, How Near Is the End? And this study guide will cover today and next week's message. And I'm pretty sure I'm going to change my mind on that. So please hold on to it, bring it back next week. Um, we're going to begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll dive straight in, because today we have part one of an exciting, information-dense, packed presentation. So get ready for some quick and dexterous pen action. Okay? You can tell I'm excited about this one. Right? <laughs> Alright, um, let's, let's begin with a word of prayer. Awesome Father in Heaven, we just pause here for a moment before we get into our message proper. As you know, Lord, today we have a, a presentation entitled, How Near Is the End? And only you know precisely when the end is. But you've given us signs, indicators in your word. Uh, that we're living at the very close of Earth's history, that we're precipitously close to the end of all things. And Lord, we've gathered here today not to hear the word of a man, but to hear the word of God. And so we ask that as we open your Bible, as we, as we open your book, Lord, that you would open our hearts. Give us understanding. As we learned previously, I will is more important than I Q. So Lord, help us today to be willing to be desirous, and by your grace to be able to follow the great and wonderful things in your word. We pray all this in the wonderful name of your only begotten Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let everyone say, Amen. 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 Okay. So, um, I'd like you to uh, take out your, your program, your study guide. And uh, I want to begin with a little bit of review. Last month, we uh, had a look at this metal man from Daniel chapter 2, remember that? Um, and in fact, if you have a look at your study guide there, the opening paragraph, it says, We believe that Jesus is coming soon. Okay, I want to give you reason today why I believe that. We asked the question, how, we, how do we know this is true? And how soon is soon? I know people have been saying for a decade, people have been saying for centuries that he's coming soon. How can we be sure that the second coming really is imminent? Fortunately, the Bible powerfully, compellingly, and clearly answers these questions. Let's turn our attention to the Bible and see what it has to say about this important topic. Now, we're just going to do a little uh, quick review there of Daniel chapter 2, just there, a quick review of Daniel 2. The great metal man of Daniel chapter 2 tells the story of the history of this planet. The five elements of that image, gold 
silver, brass, iron, and clay represented five major kingdoms from the time of Daniel to the setting up of God's kingdom. Babylon, you remember, was the, uh, the head of gold. Medo-Persia with, a, with a, ch a chest and arms of silver. Greece, the belly and thighs of bronze. And Rome, the long legs of iron. But Rome was not conquered, right? You remember, remember that? Rome was not conquered. It was divided, just like God's word said. And so here Daniel, in approximately 150 words, he accurately foretells 2,500 years of Earth's history. Beginning at the time in which he lived, Babylon, and moving through the, uh, the whole sweep of history, uh, down to divided Rome, what today we would call modern Europe. Right? Today we live in those, those feet there of uh, iron and clay, partly strong and partly weak. And the very next thing that happened, you remember, was that God would set up his own kingdom. Right? God would set up his own kingdom. And it was represented by a, um, there's, there's the, uh, the dates there, it was represented by a stone, right? And that stone, you remember, it, it hit the image in the feet and it smashed. Uh, the gold, the silver, the bronze, the iron to bits. And uh, the word of God says that that stone, it, uh, it grew and it became a big mountain and filled the whole earth. So uh, if you have a look at the bottom of your paragraph there, second to last sentence, it says, The dream applied to the latter days. And that's uh, Daniel chapter 2, verse 28. The kingdom of God is at hand. Now, as you look at this image there, this... Uh, this great timeline that moves us through the sweep of history from you know, 600 years BC until now, I want you to notice that there, there's nothing below the feet. That's it, right? God said that there would be Babylon, there's Babylon, number one. God said there would be Medo Persia, there was Medo Persia two. God said that there would be Greece, there was Greece three. God said that there would be Rome, there was Rome four. God said that Rome would be divided, Rome was divided, five. God said that Rome would remain divided, and it has remained divided, despite the uh, overtures of the so-called great men of history trying to unite Rome. It has remained divided to this day. The very next thing that happens was that God would set up his own kingdom. That's the next thing. Now, now you've got a couple options with this prophecy. And uh, incidentally, you cannot say that, you know, that's just my interpretation. I love it when people say that, right? That's just your interpretation. The reality is this. This is not Joey's interpretation. This is the interpretation. You say, well, how do we know that? Well, because, for example, if you read Daniel chapter 8, Daniel actually names Medo-Persia. You read Daniel chapter 8, Daniel actually names Greece. I didn't just make up Medo-Persia, Greece. The Bible actually says it straight up. Are you with me? And so, uh, this is, uh, and also this has been the, um, the consensus interpretation, basically, since the early days of the church. It is inescapably clear that this is exactly what God is saying. So you've got two options then. Uh, and you cannot just say that, you know, this just, just happened, you know, serendipitously, just, you know, circumstantially. No, 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 no. You've got two options. You can say what the uh, modern critics of the Bible say, that this was written two or three centuries after the time of Jesus. Right? You, you can say that. Or you could say that this was written exactly when it claims to have been written, uh, that is 600 years before the time of Jesus, God knew the future and he has accurately predicted the future. Amen? So now, um, you know, uh, now, the, now we're going to have a look at, at, at still more though, still more evidence, and still more evidence, uh, so that this does not become the only prophecy upon which we can base our prophetic faith. This is simply a cornerstone prophecy and we'll build another, and we'll build another. We'll look at Daniel chapter 7, we'll look at Daniel chapter 8, uh, Revelation chapter 13, Revelation 12, Revelation 10. And as you start building, uh, the composite picture is undeniable. Alright? So, um, so again, in this timeline, uh, the second coming of Jesus is the next thing to happen. That's the next major cataclysmic event to happen. That's the next thing. And so someone might ask, legitimately and rightfully, when will that happen? And that is our message today and next week, okay? Uh, we asked previously this question here. What would you wager? Right? If, you were, if you were a gambling person, remember I said that? Uh, what would you wager? You know, you just think it through uh, 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 in a logical manner. Um, uh, you know, we said previously that historians tell us about the past, uh, and news anchor people tell us about the present, but God alone can tell us about the future, right? And so, um, 
You don't have to be a religious person, you don't have to be a super spiritual person or, or a theologian, just to, uh, you know, just think about this uh, from a logical perspective. Okay. Now, I want to invite you to, um, I want to show you something interesting. If you open your Bibles with me to the book of Romans. Romans in the New Testament. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. Sixth book of the Bible. Romans chapter 13. And uh, here, Romans chapter 13, Paul says something that was true in his day, I think, but is at least doubly true today, Okay. Romans chapter 13, verses 11 and 12. Romans 13, 11 and 12. The Bible says, And that, knowing the time. I want you to think about those three words there. Knowing the time. It means being aware of the time in which we're living. Right? Being aware of not just the little bits of, uh, of information that, that we get from you know, the evening news or, or reading the newspaper, but being able to pan out, we need to be able to see the big picture, right? So Paul says, knowing the time, let me ask you a few questions. Back in uh, Noah's day, okay, if you were living before the flood, would it have been important to know the time in which you were living? Well, absolutely, right? Uh, during the days of Lot, okay, before Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed by fire and brimstone, would it have been important to know the day in which you were living? Yeah, if you wanted to live. Right? Before the days of Jesus, when John the Baptist was preaching, would it have been important to know the time in which you were living? To listen to John preach? Well, you know, yes, uh, because John's role was to prepare the way for Jesus. If you rejected John, you might have rejected Jesus, right? And so the Bible reveals that, reveals that uh, before anything significant happens, God always alerts His people uh, through the Word of God or through His messengers, the prophets. Okay, let, let me just repeat that. Before anything significant happens, God always first lets His people know. So, for example, back to, to the example of the flood, you know, God sent Noah, right? Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, God let Lot know. Uh, before the Exodus, God sent Moses. Before uh, Babylon, there was Isaiah, Jeremiah, the coming order of Babylon, Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah. Before the first coming of Jesus, John the Baptist. So before anything significant happens, God always first lets his people know. In fact, let me just read you a verse here. It's from uh, Amos chapter 3 and verse 7. Uh, you can always you know, turn to, to, to any of these verses that I quote for you. Uh, Amos chapter 3 verse 7. I'm just going to read it for you very quickly. So here the Bible says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. And of course the prophets, their roles are you know, to either write down the scriptures or to then tell the people. So, what this verse is saying, surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he first reveals it to his people, right? So before anything significant ever happens, God always first lets his people know. Does it not make sense that before the climax of the earth's history, the second coming of Jesus, he would let us know, he would let his people know that, that you know, it's near? I believe that there are messages in the Bible that are especially applicable to our time, okay? What, what Peter calls present truth. Truth that is especially applicable to our day. Uh, in every sort of generation of history, there's been present truth. Truth that was especially applicable to, to that generation. So, again, the example of Noah and the flood. The, the preaching of the coming flood, the message of the coming flood, that was truth that was especially applicable to Noah's day, right? So, again, so today we're living in a time when, we, when there are messages in the Bible that are especially for us, okay? So back to Romans 13 here, Paul says, And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. You ever thought about that? My salvation is some you know, 20 years nearer than when I first believed, right? Because there are two <coughs> cataclysmic events that are going to happen in my life. Either I'm going to die, or Jesus is going to come back, right? Uh, Everyone's life is going to end in one of those two ways, right? And, and if you're alive and you put your faith in Jesus when he returns, uh, you'll never die. And I want to be in that number when the saints go marching in, right? So, so Paul says, And knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. There are two great events that are racing towards you. Number one is your death, 
Number two is the second coming of Jesus. Incidentally, number one, your death, you have some control over. You, you, you can eat right, you can live healthy, you can look after your body, you, you can slow down the event, you can postpone the event, but you cannot get rid of the event altogether. Right? In fact, if you look at our advanced schedule, we have a message entitled, How to Postpone Your Funeral. Right? God, God wants you to live a healthy life. He, he created you. Right? He didn't create you to be sick. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to that. So, so number one, uh, that's your death. Number two is the second coming of Jesus. And uh, there, there's nothing you can do, though, to, to stop that event. That's coming. Incidentally, you can speed it up, but you can't slow it down, okay? Peter says uh, that you can hasten the day by the way in which you live your life and by telling others that it's coming and still others and still others, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 12. So you can hurry it up, but you cannot slow it down. Right, let's just uh, have a look at verse 12, then. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Amen. Okay, so, the end. Is it here, is it near, or is it mere fear? Notice this uh, remarkable quotation from a man by the name of Bernard McGinn from the University of Chicago. He says, over the past 30 years, more scholarship has been devoted to apocalypticism, that's last day events, than in the last 300 years. In other words, uh, from, a, from an academic point of view, from a scholastic point of view, there's been more research, more study into last day events in the past 30 years than in the foregoing, the previous 300 years. And this is not just something that, uh, that Bible scholars and theologians are dealing with, not at all. Uh, even popular media newspapers like, you know, in, like magazines like Time, National Geographic, they've run features on prophecy. And remember, remember Y2K? Uh, you forgot what that was, right? Uh, we put it out of our memory. But, you know, the newspapers and the media, uh, they, they were all over that. And uh, they gave a sense of uncertainty and even fear and trepidation going into it. And prophecy, people, some people were wondering, you know. And then the year 2012 with the Mayan prophecy, and they made a whole movie on that one. Is this going to be the end? So, uh, even popular culture has an interest in the end of all things, what's called apocalyptic studies. Uh, there's been an increase in, in the common media, in the mass media, and in the scholarly community. It's almost as if everybody's trying to, uh, to put a finger on what is going on. Right? It's almost as if there's something tangible, something palpable in the air. People have a sense that something is, is about to happen. And I'd say that that has increased. Uh, tenfold in the last decade, and especially since 9-11. Post-9-11 world is a very different world from the pre-9-11 world, and everything is in flux, right? People are wondering, what is going on? And I want to tell you today that, and I believe this with, with all my heart, and with all my, my soul, and uh, with every bit of my being, that the Bible alone can give us real, compelling, and true answers as to what is going on in the world. Uh, the politicians, they do not have the answers. They might have some of the answers, and, and you know, they'll try their best, and hey, listen, fine, 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 but they do not have the ultimate answers. Many of the world religious leaders don't, don't have the answers. God alone has the answers as to what is going on, and He has given them to us in His Word, and we can know them if we'll study them and look at them. Right? So the end. Is it here? Is it near? Or is it mere fear? And you say, well, no, that, that's religious talk, Joey. That, that's religious talk. I want you to notice the... Uh, the second page of your study guide there. The subheading says, What do the experts say? What do the experts say? It is not only the Bible and Bible believers that insist that we are living in strange and unusual times. You say, Oh, that's religious talk. You wild-eyed religious fanatics have been saying these kinds of things for a long time. Oh, sure, Jesus is coming. Oh, sure, the end of the world is coming. Now, we've heard it all before, right? Hang on with me, okay? Stay, stay with me. I want to show you today that this is not just religious talk. But I mean, uh, just for the moment, even from just an observational point of view, we are living in strange and unusual times, right? The world apart appears to be coming apart at the seams. I want to show you today that this is not just so-called religious people who believe that we are living in strange and unusual times. Um, in fact, let's, let's just finish that paragraph there. It says, many recognized experts and authorities in various fields suggest that we are living in an extraordinary and unique period of Earth's history. Many of these individuals are not writing from a biblical or theological perspective. They are simply writing from an observational and evidentiary perspective. 
they see that the evidence points in a fearful and unusual direction. I cite for you as uh, case in point number one this morning, uh, a man by the name of Eugene Linden. Okay, Eugene Linden uh, is an American journalist, very successful journalist, and uh, several years ago he wrote this book entitled The Future in Plain Sight. The subtitle of that book was Nine Clues to the Coming Instability. Nine Clues to the Coming Instability. Uh, now when Mr. Linden uses, uh, you know, when he says nine clues to the coming instability, again, he's not talking from a, he's not writing from a religious perspective, he's not writing from a biblical perspective. When he uses that language, coming instability, sometimes he calls it massive global instability, that is a secular code speak for the end of the world as we know it. Nine clues, he says, to the coming instability. Let me just share with you very briefly uh, some of Eugene Linden's concerns. Uh, and notice again, uh, none of them are biblical. None of these are so-called religious reasons, okay? Uh, this is what he says. We're, just, we're not going to spend time going into them. We'll just have a look at them very, quick, very quickly. So number one, he says, the collapse of the global economy is a real potential. Uh, the migration of the poor to cities, population explosion, both urban and rural, global warming, the economic disparity between the rich and the poor, the rich getting richer, the poor getting poorer. He says it's reaching epidemic proportions. He goes on. Collapse of the bioecosystems, water and food shortages. Number seven, infectious diseases. He cites both a resurgence of old diseases and uh, the resilience of modern diseases. He says that the, the diseases are getting smarter and are becoming more resilient to you know, antibiotics, etc. And number nine, he cites radical fundamentalism in religions. Uh, notice again, Mr. Linden is not writing from a biblical perspective. And he's saying that the world is, you know, we're living in strange times. We're living in extraordinary and, and, and an unusual time in Earth's history. I cite for you now a man that is considered by many to be the single greatest scientific mind on the planet. With a raising of hands, uh, how many of you are familiar with who this man is? Uh, Dr. Stephen Hawking, right? Uh, he's authored the most, uh, the best-selling science book of all time. It's a book entitled A Brief History of Time. Again, he's considered by many to be the greatest scientific mind on the planet. Uh, he's hailed as Einstein's successor. Uh, you're lo looking at his image there, and of course, um, you know, he doesn't look very well because he's got a terrible disease, Lou Gehrig's disease, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Uh, he's not able to speak, as a matter of fact. Uh, all he has is a little bit of movement in one of his fingers, which he's able to use a very sophisticated computer and sort of craft sentences, etc., etc. He does presentations. Recently, he spoke at a convention of thought leaders and academic leaders and others, and uh, this is how he concluded. Dr. Stephen Hawking concluded his uh, lecture there that was entitled, Is Mankind Determined or Free? I want you to notice, now, the language is a little uh, obtuse, and I apologize for that, but you'll get the thrust of it right away, okay? Dr. Stephen Hawking said this, I fear that since the evolutionary process, and of course he believes in the process of evolution, and perhaps we'll talk more about that uh, later on in our seminar. I fear that since the evolutionary process has worked through the dialectic of determinism and aggression, our long-term survival and any hope for our species is in question. You see what he's saying? He's saying, I'm concerned. I'm very concerned. I mean, the man held the Sir Isaac Newton Chair of Mathematics at Cambridge University. He says, I'm concerned. Notice what he says next. However, here's a solution. However, says Dr. Hawking, if we can keep from destroying each other for the next 100 years, sufficient technology will have been developed to distribute humanity to various planets, and then no one tragedy or atrocity will eradicate us all at the same time. Uh, you see what he's saying? Uh, we're living in strange times. We're living in unusual times. He says, I'm concerned about the long-term survival of our species. However, if we can just keep from destroying each other for 100 years, uh, then sufficient technology would have been developed so that, it, you know, uh, you, Nigel, might go to Mars, and uh, uh, you, Ian, might go to another planet, and we can all go to different planets, and then no one tra uh, tragedy or one atrocity will eradicate us all at the same time. Uh, am I the only person here today who thinks that that sounds a little crazy? And that is not out of disrespect to Dr. Hawking. I think he's a brilliant man, but, you know, and I hope he... he, he um, comes to know the Lord Jesus as his own personal Lord and Savior, but the point is, is that is a little strange. He says, hey listen, look at this planet. It's waxing old like a garment. Look at this planet. It's, it's growing under the weight of all these things. This worries him. 
Again, not from a biblical perspective, not from a religious perspective, not from a theological perspective, simply from a scientific or an observational perspective. Let's uh, turn our attention now to the Bible. I cite these instances for you, and we'll give even more of them, to show that this is not just so-called, you know, wild-eyed religious fanatics who believe or insist that we're living in strange and unusual times. In fact, I would say if you don't think that we're living in strange and unusual times, you're not paying attention, right? Have a look here. One out of every 25 verses in the New Testament is related to the what, everyone? The second coming. One out of every 25 verses. We're just going to have a quick look at five verses from uh, Revelation. Uh, as a matter of fact, they're all listed there in your study guide. Um, I've got them on screen for you as well. And as we look at these verses, I want you to notice that every one of them, uh, there's something in common, okay? Let's have a quick look. So Revelation chapter 1 verse 7, it says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, he being uh, Jesus, of course. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. That's Revelation chapter 1 verse 7. Here's the next one, Revelation 3, verse 11. The Bible says, Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Uh, the Bible has promised those who put their faith in Jesus Christ a crown of righteousness. Jesus says, Behold, I come quickly. See that no one takes that crown that rightfully belongs to you. Okay? Uh, Revelation chapter 22, verse 7. The Bible says, Behold, I come quickly, Jesus speaking, Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. That book being, of course, the uh, book of uh, Revelation here. Uh, verse 12 of the same chapter, Revelation 22, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his word shall be. There's a coming judgment, and that judgment is going to determine rewards. Jesus says, I'm coming with those rewards. Uh, our last verse there, Revelation chapter 22, verse 20, he which testifieth these things saith. So Jesus is the one who is testifying. He, Jesus says, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. So, so five, five verses, five times, Jesus says, I come quickly. I come quickly. I come quickly. <laughs> what do these verses have in common? There's a sense of urgency here. Right? God is saying it's not time to be lazy. Uh, and you might, you, know, you, you, might, you might say, wait a minute. You know, the book of Revelation was written some 2,000 years ago. You're right. But in the book of Revelation, there is a key that lets us know when quickly is really quickly. Okay. Have a look at uh, your study guide there. So what do these verses have in common? There's a sense of urgency in every one of them. Clearly, the second coming is a prominent component of Revelation. It is the capstone of the book, the whole Bible, and God's eternal plan of salvation. But notice the next subheading there. How quick is quick? How soon is soon? And how close is close? These are excellent questions. These are the very kinds of questions that people ask today. They might say something like, people have been saying for years that Jesus would return. How do you know he actually will, right? Uh, maybe, you know, you tried to share with a family member, or you tried to share with a, a friend. Uh, come on, people have been saying that forever. How do you really know, right? They say it sometimes with a, a sense of, uh, you know, a snicker or, or sly sense of, uh, come on, get over it. Notice here, there's a key in our next verse, also from Revelation, Revelation chapter 16, verse 15. The Bible says, Behold, I come as a thief, Jesus speaking. Blessed is he that watcheth and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Now, this is not talking about literal nakedness. This is talking about spiritual nakedness, which is what happens when you've not put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's not the main thing we want to have a look at right now. What I want you to notice is that the operative word in this passage is the word watch. In fact, if you I notice you're blank there, uh, the question is asked, what is the operative word in this passage? The word is watch. What does watch mean? Watch means to look. To see, uh, in fact, if you remember those five verses we just listed from Revelation, many of them began with the word behold. What does that mean, behold? Beauty is in the, in the eye of the beholder. What does that mean, to behold? It means to, to look. So there's this uh, reverberating bottom line here that says, look, look, right? look. He 
Here the Bible says in Revelation 16, verse 15, blessed is he who looks. Very interesting. I want to share with you uh, several more verses here. Again, these are listed in your study guide. Matthew 24, verse 42. Jesus says, watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. Okay, Jesus says, watch. Next one here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 4 and 6. Paul writing, he says, Paul writing to the church in uh, Thessalonica, Thessalonica, he says, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Uh, again, there's that language. Many, many people have heard that, that language before. You know, Jesus comes as a thief, as a thief in the night. What does that mean? Uh, we're going to study that in a future presentation. So, but ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day, that day being the second coming in context, should overtake you as a thief. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do. Paul knew that there'd be those who would be asleep. Paul knew that there'd be those who would say, ah, oh, we've heard that before, right? No, he says, let us not sleep as others do, but let us, what? Watch and be sober. That means to be serious-minded. That doesn't mean you can't have a little fun. You know, I, I love to have fun, and I've done some pretty crazy funny things, but uh, we should be sober, serious-minded about the times in which we're living, right? So Paul says, watch. Uh, Jesus said, watch uh, in Matthew. Uh, John says, watch in, in, uh, in Revelation. Uh, and uh, I think I've got one more there. Peter also says, watch. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober, there's that word again, and watch unto prayer. So Peter says, watch. Paul says, watch. John says, watch. Jesus says, watch. Is there any question in anybody's mind today that, we're, that the Bible is telling us to watch for something? Right? The question is, for what? Does this sound good? Okay. Keep your eye out. I tell you, keep your eye out, keep your eye out. But what are we to keep our eye out for? Uh, have a look at the uh, top of page three in your study guide. There's a question asked uh, there. It says, what do all these verses have in common? Uh, all of these verses deal with the end of time. Uh, in fact, every single verse that we've looked up this morning deals with the end of time. Okay, every one of them. The last three verses that we've just looked up all of these verses tell us to watch. But the question is, for what? Um, the disciples uh, questioned Jesus on one occasion about the end of the world. Uh, open your Bibles with me to um, the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 24. Our first book of the uh, New Testament. Matthew chapter 24. We're being told to watch. The question is, for what? Let's begin to answer that question by having a look at Matthew chapter 24, beginning in verse 1. Okay? Matthew chapter 24, verse 1. It says, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. Jesus left the temple. And his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. The disciples were trying to um, cheer Jesus up. And the reason they were trying to cheer him up was because... Uh, if you read the uh, last three verses of the previous chapter, and the first one of this chapter, Jesus had left the temple uh, for the last time. Uh, he, he had, um, in fact, actually, let's just, let's just uh, read verse 37 there, uh, of chapter 23. Matthew 23, verse 37, Jesus speaking, he says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings? But ye would not, you were not willing. Uh, and never forget this. Uh, God is a gentleman. He will not force his way into your life. He stands at the door and knocks. He pleads, he hopes, he calls. But he will not force. You have free will. Jesus says, I wanted to, ga I wanted to gather you as a hen gathers her chicks. Verse 38. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth, till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And then, verse, and then chapter 24, verse 1, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. So Jesus left the temple there for the last time. And Jesus, the Messiah, the very one to whom the temple pointed to, uh, that was the last time he had stepped foot in, those, in, 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 the, in the temple precincts. He walks out, and he goes up on a mountain called the Mount of Olives. Um, and his heart was... It, he was, his heart was burdened, his heart was saddened, uh, and he goes up on the mountain, and uh, the, the disciples, uh, they could tell that there was something wrong, okay? Jesus began his ministry, if you might 
remind, remember the story there. He began his ministry, um, he walked into the temple, and he, and he threw out all those money changers. Right? Remember that story? Uh, he, went up there, he went in there, he said, take these things out of here, you have made my father's house a den of thieves. So at the beginning of his ministry, Jesus said, my father's house. But here in the end, he says, verse 38 of chapter 23, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. So three and a half years earlier, it was my father's house. Now here at the end of his ministry, it's your house. Why? Because the Jewish nation had consistently rejected the evidences of Jesus' messiahship. Okay, Jesus says, what more can I do? You won't see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Uh, and then he walks out, he goes up on the Mount of Olives, he sits down, and the disciples come in verse 1 to try and cheer him up. Oh Jesus, you know, uh, look at how beautiful the temple is. Oh Jesus, look at how the sun glistens on its glorious marble walls. But Jesus would not be comforted. Have a look at verse 2 there. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. The very thing that the disciples were trying to cheer Jesus up with, Jesus says, do you see it all? It's all going to be destroyed. In fact, it's going to be so destroyed, so utterly decimated, not one stone will be left upon another. That is, the temple destroyed, Jerusalem destroyed, and in the, in the minds of the disciples, they're thinking, what? The destruction of the temple? The destruction of Jerusalem? Surely, he's talking about the end of the world, the end of the age, what the Greeks call the eschaton. Uh, oh, he must mean, you know, the end of all things. Notice verse 3. And as he sat up upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? The disciples thought they were asking one question. They thought they were asking one question. But when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? Well, that's actually two questions. And what Jesus does here is he, he parallels, he dovetails the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 under the Roman Emperor Titus, and the end of the world, the second coming. And that's really what Matthew chapter 24 is, is this marvelous answer in which Jesus takes these two events and he sort of interweaves them into this marvelous tapestry. Uh, have a look at your study guide there. Third page, the subheading says, Consider Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse. Uh, and of course it's called the Olivet Discourse because Jesus gave this discourse on the Mount of Olives. In Matthew 24, Jesus deals with the issue of the end of the world. In this chapter, Jesus masterfully, the word is parallels, the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD with the destruction of the world at the end of the age. In this parallel, Jesus employs two revealing and helpful analogies for understanding the last days and the end of the world. Let's just have a quick look at those two analogies there. The, the first one is, uh, is actually found in uh, verse 8 of Matthew 24. So if you have a look at verse 8. Okay, so Matthew 24, verse 8. Now my Bible says, All these are the beginning of sorrows. All these are the beginning of sorrows. How many of you have a translation today that say the same thing in Matthew 24, verse 8? All these are the beginning of sorrows. You have something that says something different? Birth pains. Birth pains. That's it. Uh, that's what the Greek word says here. Okay, the Greek word is actually the word for, for birth pains or birth pangs. Just like the uh, RSV says here, all this is the beginning of, uh, of birth pangs, uh, you know, contractions. Uh, that's the Greek word that Jesus is employing here. Of course, he was probably speaking in Aramaic, but <clears throat> Jesus says, all this. Uh, you say, well, all of what? And that's what we're going to get to next time. All this is the beginning of birth pangs. He uses the analogy of, of birth pangs, contractions. Jesus employs a second analogy. If you jump down to verse 32, Matthew 24, verse 32. Here Jesus says, Now learn a parable. And of course a parable is a story that illustrates a larger spiritual significance. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. Okay, he's going to teach us a lesson from a tree. Very important. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. 
when his branch is yet tender, and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. Verse 33, he makes the application. So likewise, ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Jesus uses two analogies here. These two analogies are, number one, <clears throat> uh, labor pains, and number two, a budding fig tree. Now, I grew up in northern Alberta in Canada, and uh, I knew something about harsh winters, uh, and every year when uh, you know, spring was just around the corner, uh, we knew that it was coming. I mean, there was a market transition from winter to spring. We're talking like minus 30 to you know, plus digits, right? So, uh, and of course, the, the branches would become tender, and, and the leaves would, become, would begin to appear, uh, and we knew that spring would eventually herald summer, right? And Jesus says, hey, pay attention. He uses two analogies, labor pains and a budding fig tree. These two analogies have three things in common. Three things in common. Number one, they are visible. Number one, they are visible. Number two, they are progressive. That is, they start here, and they move toward here, and as they move, they increase in frequency and in intensity. Right? They're, they're progressive. Number three, they're climactic. The budding fig tree announces summer. Uh, the labor pains of a woman's contraction announce the birth of a child. Uh, they both end at something, an event. You say, well, what is it? Uh, what are we meant to watch for? You know, Jesus says watch, Paul says watch, Peter says watch, John says watch. Watch, watch, watch. We haven't even talked about what we're watching for. Stay tuned, right? Stay tuned. Next time, we're going to talk about <clears throat> specific signs that Jesus told us to watch for. Signs of the times that demonstrate that Jesus' second coming is very near. And I believe that with all my heart. What did Paul say? Knowing the time, right? He said, knowing the time. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, and that means, uh, instead of just getting the little data, you know, just looking at the little, little data that comes to us uh, by the news, what we're going to do is we're going to pan out, okay? And, and we're going to see the big picture from God's perspective. You know what I mean when I say pan out, right? Like, like you have a video camera there and you can, you can zoom in, or you can pan out. And uh, one of the great things that Bible prophecy helps us to do is it helps us to pan out and to see the great scope of things. And so, uh, for example, if you were to plot, okay, say, say you were going to like plot Earth's history, okay? Say you're just going to start plotting some of the major events of Earth's history. Uh, so you've got creation there. This, this is our plot. You've got creation. You'd have the flood. Flood's sort of here, right? And then you'd, you'd have the various events uh, that happened to the nation of Israel. You have, um, you know, the Exodus. Going into Babylon, coming out of Babylon, becoming the Messiah, you'd have the, the early church. Of course, this is obviously not to scale. You have the early church, it, it does its thing then, and you've got the Dark Ages. Of course, back here, you've got Babylon, you know, Persia, Greece, Rome. Uh, and so, and over there, you've got the, you know, the, the great prophecies of Revelation 12 and 13. And so, basically, if you stand back and have a look at the big picture, you get perspective. We know that we're not living anywhere here in the great scheme of time, right? Incidentally, something very interesting. There's 2,000 years from creation to Abraham. There's 2,000 years from Abraham to Christ. And there's 2,000 years from Christ to us now. Okay, very interesting. We'll, we'll come back to that. Uh, so again, um, no, we're living all the way down here. And, and the second coming is here. And you say, well, wait a minute. You've marked the terminal point here. You've marked the end here. What gives you the right to, to mark the end there? Well, that's what the prophecies are pointing to. And as we study the great prophecies of Revelation, Revelation 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 17, 18, what we're going to see is a lot of them are coming to pass right now. Right? So as we look at the great sweep of things, and of course, I, no, I'm not going to tell you that Jesus is coming back June 3rd, 2020. I'd never say that, because the Bible says, no man knows the day or the hour. Amen? The angels don't even know. Only God knows. But I can tell you this. We're living all the way down here. Bible prophecy helps us to pan out to see the big picture. It helps us to realize where we are in the, in the, big, in the great stream of time. Okay? Uh, it's not business as usual. Bible prophecy imbues us with a sense of urgency. Next time, we're going to have a look at the signs of the times. The signs that are just screaming at us, alerting us to the fact that there's not much time left. Uh, th this world is spinning out of control. Right? We're, we're, it's groaning under the, the weight of all this evil. You know, you were not created to live in this sin-ravaged earth and to see the filth that takes place everywhere. 
You know, when um, God created Adam and Eve there in the Garden of Eden, there was another tree there called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You see, God never intended Adam and Eve to know evil experientially. They could have known it intellectually. Right? God knows it intellectually. The angels know it intellectually. They, they saw this fall of Satan in heaven. Evil is, not, is something that, that, God, that they could have known intellectually, but God never intended for them to know it experientially. Is there a difference? Sure. You want your children to know the dangers of getting addicted to heroin. Isn't that true? But you don't want them addicted to heroin to get that knowledge. And so today when you see the filth and the trash and the repugnancy that takes place everywhere, God did not build you for that. Jesus is coming. He's going to set up his own kingdom uh, one day in the not too distant future. And the sin and the pain and the suffering and the sorrow and the disease and death, all these atrocities and tragedies and injustices and iniquities that rage on this earth are going to be gone. And God created us for a better place. And he wants to prepare you and I for that place. Amen? Right. Uh, we're a bit early, but uh, let's just finish up with a word of prayer. Precious Father in heaven, we come to you uh, just as we are, to be wholly yours, Lord, in this critical time in earth's history. Father, help us to turn our eyes to Jesus. Help us, Lord, in our faith and to put our trust in you. Help us to live wholly with reference to the second coming of Jesus. We pray all this in Jesus' mighty name. Let everyone say, Amen. 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 Alright. That, that, that is the first. <laughs> Early. That is incredible. So, uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed your pre the presentation today. Uh, Hang on to your study guides, bring them back next week. We're going to have a look at the size of the times okay, and finish up this, uh, this study guide here. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.